Okay, we're recording. Great. So again, welcome, welcome everybody. Um, so this is again the uh, Emma Back to the Cell study course in preparation for our return to our cell uh, collectively, our return to our cells in 2021. Um, we're starting this um, session by taking a look through the Getty uh, a manuscript. Um, and we're, we're doing this not only to get a chance to sit together and to look at it, but also to um, use this as an opportunity to pick out things um, that we would normally likely only see on the cell floor. So most um, recruits and Emma Sal's, um, they may have a copy of the book. Um, they may refer to it from time to time, but usually they're not, you know, they don't, <laughs> they don't read it before bed every, every day. That's, that's scholar territory. <laughs> um, so oftentimes people aren't, um, haven't actually looked at the book very much, not exactly familiar. And um, there's a long way between the book and uh, drills that happen on the cell floor things that happen on the south floor. So one of the things I hope everybody gets from these sessions is an idea of where this information that we're teaching you is coming from and why it looks the way it looks when um, when we get it to you. Um, I say, I'm gonna say this before every class. Obviously, I am guiding everyone here through the, um, the Getty um, as a free scholar of Emma. Um, you're gonna get my view um, in my analysis, broadly speaking, about what we're looking at, although obviously, um, where possible, I will take pains to um, give a complicated view um, where appropriate. But um, n regardless, um, as with everything at Emma, nothing is the case just because it's said, much less by an instructor. Um, we want you to be persuaded by the evidence that we're persuaded by to think that things are X or Y, right? So um, one of the things that I'm going to be doing in these sessions is trying to show, make statements about what we think the manuscript is, why we do things, et cetera, et cetera, but to show where these things come from in the manuscript, right? Um, we don't, might not have time to talk about them on the south floor because there's too much training to do. Um, but they, they, they do come from somewhere and the academic work and the theoretical work is, uh, is still really important, right? And it underpins everything that we do in class. So um, the first session, um, this is the first recorded session for those watching the recording. The first two sessions were not recorded. Um, but the first session was basically a broad um, rambling look at um, history in general, um, the problems and challenges associated with medieval history, and um, some of the some of the challenges with the source material that um, that is the foundation of the study of historical European martial arts. Um, and so we, we we looked at had history a bit. We looked at um, at Fiore and the nature of Fiore and his work. And we gave us we gave ourselves a little context. The second class, which was last week, we started with Fiore. We started by looking at the preface to the Abrazari section, and then we got into the first. Uh, well, then we got into the Abrazari section. We looked at the first uh, four guards, and we looked at the first six plays. Okay. So today we're going to pick up where we left off and we're going to look at the, um, we're going to start with the, we'll, we'll pick back up with the sixth play. I just want to, um, want to close this loop again, the, the fifth and sixth play here. The, oh, sorry, I lied to you. These two here, the two shears. <clears throat> and then we're going to start, uh, or we'll, then we'll, we'll get to the next play and so on, uh, as we go. Okay, um, does anybody have any questions or any comments about anything before we start today's session? Okay, uh, uh, as normal, I'm going to plan on formally finishing it at 930, but um, it'll continue if people stick around till 10 o'clock. Um, we'll do, we can do questions and other things after that. Uh, also, as we go, if you have a question, please say so. Either type it or say it. Otherwise, 
um, I'm not going to know, and I'll just probably keep talking. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so let's get into it. Um, so the last half of get last week's session, we looked at the first five plays here. The first master, or the first rem, uh, a remedy master of of um, of grappling, um, the scholar that finishes his play. Then we looked at the third um, the the third play of grappling, um, where we have this we have what's colloquially known as the third play, but we have the another possible result um, of this second play here. So in the text, Fiore. Um, D describes these three plays as potentially happening in sequence, whereas this is the beginning of it, this is the attempted finish, and if the enemy counters this break, then he can give you the third play, the opportunity for the third play. So colloquially, we, um, in most MSLs, to my knowledge, these three are usually done uh, one after the other. They're usually done as a set. And they're done as a response to a high grab. Okay? Um, yeah. And then we have the fourth and fifth play here, um, where they're not written in the text as following after, though one might contrive that they do. One might think that they do, and of course they could, right? They, you know, something could happen to this this position as a counter to make it so that the you know the scholar can try the fourth play, whatever. Um, they don't, uh, so they don't follow from these three. They don't even follow from each other, um, strictly speaking. So the text of the just to just to make a point there, um, the text of the fourth does not mention the text of the fifth, and vice versa. So this is the fourth play of Abrazari, which succeeds easily if the student can put the opponent to the ground. If you can't do it in this manner, you can use um, other plays or grapples in ways that you'll see later. And then he makes some general commentary. Okay. And then in the fifth play, he says, in this grapple, so this is this play here, uh, Folio 7RA. In this grapple, I use my right hand against your throat to give you pain and suffering, which will cause you to go to the ground. Also, if I grab you under the left knee with my left hand... Uh, I will be even sure of your falling down. So unlike these three plays here, 6VA, 6VB, and 6VC, 6VD and um, 7RA, the fourth and fifth play colloquially known, don't reference each other. However, most MSLs still consider them as siblings. Okay? And this is because... These two plays here, the fourth play here, and the fifth play here, these two plays are um, a gra grappling actions which are done at a different distance than the first three plays here. We ended last class, and this is why I'm reprising it, we ended last class very briefly discussing three broad distances of engagement in grappling. One distance is where um, you're the farthest away you can possibly be from the other person. Um, where your principal actions will be striking uh, with the legs and, and hands and, and arms and whatnot, um, but you're not getting any closer other than what you need to strike. Then you have a middle distance, which is when there's still space between the bodies of the of the opponents. There's still space here, but grappling limbs and the access to the core is available. Um, but strikes are all also available. So this is these three plays here are occurring in this middle distance. Although arguably, when this play is completed, it's completed in a close grappling uh, distance. But there's dispute about that. Um, so this, yeah, these three plays are in this middle distance, and then these two plays here, the fourth and the fifth, are done in this close distance, where which we call close grappling. Cro close grappling has three main holds. It has double underneath double over or cross body so this play here the gambarola which we're going to look at today is an example of a cross body close grappling situation okay whereas this play here the knee to the balls play this is an example of the other two holds so in this case both both players 
have a cross body hold. So one hand is high over another person's arm or over the enemy's arm. And one hand is low under the enemy's arm. In this scenario, both your hands are under or both your hands are over. Okay. So, um, and this is important. Yep. Is there a question? No? Okay, cool. So this is important to get because it's just broad context for us, right? One of the things that we, we read in the, the introduction to the grappling section was that Fiore wanted to talk about the most common situations of life or death combat, okay? And um, these, these observations about how human bodies go together form the basis uh, of our understanding of common situations, right? What constitutes a common situation? So anyway, um, we have these first three plays here that are occurring in this middle distance. And then we have these next two plays here, the fourth and fifth play occurring in this close distance. Okay, this um, uh, this uh, close body grappling. Okay. Um, we consider these plays that go together. Be, um, well, okay, so the main reason why we make these observations about these three plays going together and these two plays belonging together. The main reason is the pictures. Okay. Now we might make that connection by the text alone, but I doubt it. Right. We rely heavily on the pictures here to contextualize. And this is a, this is a concept of controversy that I'm going to be continually referring to because I believe that every Fiore scholar Fure... needs to um, needs to be conscious of what evidences they're relying on to do what work. And sometimes you don't even notice how much work a certain piece of evidence is doing in your belief about something, right? Um, you know, the 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 fourth and fifth plays here. The sh what we call the what we call shears, where you're holding one part of the body and pushing away another. The principal evidence for the shears is the picture. The text doesn't really say much, right? And this is fairly common throughout Fury, right? And so you know, this is important for us to us to know. It's, imp it's important for us to um, remember because there are certain places, the certain certain plays where our confidence in our understanding of the play is going to be tested by errors or inconsistencies in the picture um, or inconsistencies between the text and the pictures and, and whatnot. Okay, um, all that sort of preamble, um, that pretty much brings us back to where we, um, where we are right now. So let's get right into it. So we're going to resume. Um, we're going to resume starting with the... Uh, this play here, Folio 7RB, which is a counter. It's our first countermaster. Okay. And um, I'm just going to go down the list when I ask people to read, just so we can have a little interaction. Alex K., would you like to read the text for this play? Uh, yes. I am the counter to the fifth play just shown. I use my right hand against his arm to remove his hand from my face. I can turn him and put him to the ground as shown or I will gain a good grapple or bind, and your Abrazari won't give me much worry. All right. So <clears throat> this is, let's make a mental note of this play here, which is an elbow push, okay? This is very affectionately known in the Emma community as the universal counter, principally because Fiore never shuts up about it. He talks about it all the time. Um, he repeats. He repeats this play all the time. In the book and this is curious because he, as we know fiori has already set up a structure where the book is going to rely on concepts and principles that have already been explained previously right so fiori is setting himself up to not have to repeat himself if he doesn't want to now, this, when he does repeat himself after that, that either means he's being a bit pedantic or he's repeating himself for a reason or he forgot what he put before. <laughs> One of those three things. Likely, 
it's for a reason, right? It's likely it's for a reason. So if we see, the, if we look at the family comparison of this play here, so here's this same play in all the different um, different manuscripts, okay? Um, very similar. Uh, we're not going to do this too often because I don't want to get us off track. But uh, um, this play, um, anyway, th this plays in all of the um, all the manuscripts that have grappling sections. This plays in it. This plays even in the Paris. Uh, the Paris doesn't have that many plays in it. It's pretty uh, short. Um, it's not in the Morgan only because the, there's no grappling section in the in the Morgan. It's uh, lost. So um, we're going to see this a lot. Um, there's not much to say here from um, um, from my perspective other than just this happens all the time. Uh, elbow pushes are typical from below naturally, right? They're typical from below, and as a consequence of that, they're typical to occur when the enemy's arms are chest height or higher. So you can push elbows from above. So let's just say, um, you know, this person's hand, the, the enemy's hand was at his, at his waist, and he like reached over to the elbow and tried to push it from outside. You can do that, but it's not the same sort of thing um as as what's going on here okay so a, a bit different tactically here he's coming up <clears throat> underneath the elbow <clears throat> excuse me and what you're what you're at uh, what you're getting when you do this is you're getting immediate access to the enemies outside so if everyone if you stretched out your arms right in front of you everything between your two arms is the inside of your position and outside of those arms is the outside of your position and being on the outside of someone's position is extremely desirable for a bunch of reasons and elbow pushes threaten to put you immediately to someone's outside as well as potentially turn that person around and get you all sorts of advantages so they're great and everybody's got two of them so there's always an elbow push on offer unless someone's being very disciplined and not giving it to you okay moving on um, now, before we before we get to the next bunch, um, I'm going to draw a little border around this stuff. So it's my personal view, some share it, um, many do not, that the first six plays in the grappling section are more universal than the others. And by that I mean these three plays here, one, two, three, these constitute a universal counter to anyone who grabs you standing up chest height or higher right if they grab your waist then well you know even if if they grab your waist you could just launch into a, th a third play kind of action here but these constitute a, a universal action against anyone who grabs you with um uh, on high if it's a grab with a bent arm you get a third play opportunity if it's a grab with a straight arm, you get an arm break opportunity. And these two plays, the fourth and fifth, constitute a universal reaction to anyone who enters into close grappling with you. And we see this because in both the fourth and the fifth play, the scholar is lead foot, lead hand, pushing the face. Lead foot, lead hand, pushing the face. But the opponent has different footedness. In the fourth uh, scholar, he's got his right foot forward, and in the fifth, uh, he's got his left foot forward. So I take that to mean, if it means anything, I take it to mean that the scholar doesn't care about the enemy's footedness. And regardless, because he's essentially doing the same thing. He's essentially doing the same thing. So regardless of the footedness of the enemy, you can try this thing. You don't have to keep track of it. So that means that this also constitutes a universal counter to close grappling. Okay. Now it's just one thing, or it's just one move, as it were, right? It's in it's in no way the be all and end all of wrestling. But Fiore did say this is what he was going to do. He was going to talk about the most common situations of life or death combat, and he was going to make some commentary. So right at the beginning. I think he's given us a universal counter against high grabs, which are the most common thing to happen in stand-up Abrazari, and close grappling, we have a universal counter. The only thing so far he hasn't talked about is defense against striking, and he doesn't talk about that at all. Although, 
He does have Frontale as a posta, which is a typical striking defense guard. And he, ta he says that striking is super important in the preface. So he knows it's there. He knows it's part of this. He doesn't talk about it. Why not? Who knows? But the first five plays are quite universal in their approach, or at least they seem to be. And that includes this one. This is the, the elbow push we just talked about. So um, it's my belief that you can take these first few as a set. If you had to point to the heart of the grappling uh, section, I would say it would be this, if it's anything. The rest, and we're going to see this today, the rest seem to be more a collection of um, more unique circumstances. So just to s summarize, we have a standing throw, we have a poke into the, the ear, we have an escape from behind, we have a trip up, we have an escape from a uh, full Nelson, we have a strike to the balls, push to the face, another elbow push with a knee grab, we have um, a... Uh, we have another push to the face, and then we have a counter to the push to the face, which is an eye gouge. So that's what's in store for us today. Um, and uh, I, I think it's fair to say that though these are things that happen in, in, in Abrazari, the first six plays seem to be substantially more universal in their scope and more instructive to us as students about what the hell this thing Abrazari is and what the hell are, are, are we in store for um, than these, the next plays that come. The next plays that come seem to be fairly specific. Uh, and this, uh, as, a, as a, a grappler in my youth, I can say that now, now that I'm no longer in my youth as, as, as such, uh, as a grappler um, in my youth, that fits with a grappler's intuition. Because every, every, um, every grappler will have a set of basic skills that they use, but then they'll also have the repertoire of tricks, or rather of moves, right? Um, every great wrestler's got a large repertoire of moves, and they're all based on this really simple premise of two guys fighting without any weapons, but there's all sorts of little things you can do. There's all sorts of little, uh, all sorts of, of unique situations that can happen, like this full Nelson, um, that it's nice to have, it's nice to have uh, a little trick in the in your pocket, so you don't have to think about it too much if it happens to you. Okay. So here's what we're going to see. We're going to see um, now a bunch of different scenarios, and things that Fury suggests that we might do. Okay. Um, any questions before we move on to this to the seventh play? I should also add that. Um, I, uh, I started off this session or I started off the, the, uh, this, this course by making a big deal about how, <laughs> uh, the folio notation is the only useful way for different Furious to talk about Fiori w with each other because very few people, you know, are able to keep track of what play, what scholar, but the folio notation cannot be false. If I say Folio 7 RC, I can only mean one play. Nobody could make a mistake. Um, I'm not using the Folio notation very much, principally because we're looking at the images, so I'm referring to it more colloquially. colloquially. But if anybody needs the Folio notation, if you're following along in your own text and not watching the stream, um, a bunch of people are doing that because they can't, uh, they, they can't handle the bandwidth, um, then if you need a Folio notation, please do ask for it or, or, or type it in or whatever and I'll provide it. All right, <clears throat> moving on. Seventh play of grappling, we have what is often called the fireman's carry, although that's um, not as useful as it seems. Uh, who would like to read next? Uh, Beatty, would you like to give us a go? Certainly. Thanks to the grapple I have gained and the way I hold you, I will lift you from the ground with all my might and have you under my feet, head first, then body. There is not an appropriate counter to this play. Okay, so two um, interesting things about this. Okay, well, um, first of all, let's talk about what the hell it is. So this is a, this is a standing throw. Um, it's, uh, it's got many similar versions in various grappling uh, arts. 
Um, no, I didn't want that. I wanted this. Um, but it's it's pretty it's a pretty conventional play as 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 wrestling goes. However, um, the Getty uh, <laughs> the Getty has it drawn weird. Okay, or rather, the image in the Getty does not fit our intuition. And this this is the first time I think that we're we're going to have this co this conflict between picture and uh, um, and text. Or at least we're going to notice something odd in, in the picture. I don't think I've made that point yet. Um, so what's counterintuitive about this picture in the Getty is that notice the leg that he's picking up. He's picking up the opposite leg from the side that he entered in on, the scholar entered in on. So conventionally, how this would work is exactly the way it's drawn in the PD and in the Paris, where you're going to enter underneath the arm on either side, it doesn't matter. In this case, everybody's entering on the enemy's right side. You're entering underneath the arm, keeping a straight back. You're going to be shifting some of that enemy's weight onto your shoulder, your right shoulder, and then you're going to be picking them up and basically suplexing them on the ground, dropping them head first, all while r remaining erect, right? Um, the classic fireman's carry in in, um, in wrestling has to um, kind of cheats this. Um, you you go down on one knee, dragging that person's body with you, and you kind of shovel them over your shoulders. Um, this is much safer for the enemy. It's not as punishing, and it's also easier to do. But um, Fury's not going for safe here. He's going for um, for asshole level of, of injury. So we're throwing this we're throwing this person on their head from standing. This is a very devastating throw. Could he potentially kill somebody, break their neck, whatever. Um, intuitively, we're going to do something like this. Um, it's arguable whether or not Fury is grabbing this person's uh, private parts or not. Um, that might help. I've never tried it, honestly. Might be worth a... <laughs> <laughs> might be worth a try uh, uh, when we get back to the cell. But point being, you can see what's going on here, right? He's entering in underneath a position on the same side, and he's going to be picking this person straight up, and he's going to be dropping them on their head. Okay? The Getty picture is shown uh, counterintuitively. He's picking, it up, he's picking up the left leg rather than the right leg. And a number of people have tried to do this and make it work. Um, I've never seen anything convincing yet on myself. So isn't that interesting? But the point is, beyond this interesting little scholarly uh, uh, controversy, uh, the the notion of the play is clear. It's some kind of standard standing uh, th throw over the shoulder. Okay? Um, two more points. Fiore says that we should do this with all our might. Okay. Fiori does not say this very often. I can think of maybe two times, maybe, at most, that he says that uh, of those words. He uses that expression. Two times only. So I'm inclined to take him for his word. I'm inclined to think that that's important, an important anecdote. Um, a lot of the things in martial arts we constantly advocate, uh, especially to new students, teachers will constantly advocate not doing things with all your might because it's a very easy thing to try and overcome a lack of technical skill to do in doing something by using force and ma making it work uh, uh, that way, rather than by leverage and with, with technique. This is often the case, but in this situation, while there is a significant technique going on here that is needs to be learned and practiced, Fiori says specifically, oh, and also you lift him with all your might. So I think it's safe to say then that this play, this situation, requires some strength. Or rather, a lot of strength is useful if you want to do this sort of thing. Okay? Not super illuminating, but it needs to be said, right? Fiori did say it specifically. Lastly, um, we have his anecdote about countering. He says, oh, oh, let's go back to where we were. Forgive me. He says, 
you won't be able to perform a good counter to this. So what does this mean? Okay, Fury says this a number of times in the book. Um, how ought we to read it? So in good martial arts, there's usually always a counter. Okay, um, if uh, one of the principles that we get from a later fencing master named George Silver um, from England, um, from the around uh, right around 1600, is um, between two men against the best, between two two people against between masters, no hurt can be done. So if everybody makes this the right the right decision, if everybody makes the right call. No hits should be made. No one should get hit in a, in a fencing match or, or, or whatever. Usually this doesn't happen in reality because somebody makes a mistake. But it is in principle possible to make an appropriate response to everything that's done to you. Now when Fiori says, if you do this, this does not admit of a counter. What he means when he says this is not that you couldn't possibly stop this from happening. Clearly, that's not true. There'd be, there'd be a number of easy ways to counter this play if you saw it happening early enough. But what he means to say is once this is going, once this is on its way, there's no good counter. And principally why there's no good counter in this case is because the first thing that's taken from the enemy is their fortitudo. We haven't actually talked about this yet in the... In the um, in this these sessions we haven't talked about the um fiore's senyo page which we may have to i'm not sure how long we can go without talking about that this is halfway through the book um so we're, i'm going to delay it as long as possible because i want to i want to walk from the beginning to the end but um fortitudo just to take a very very quick look maybe we'll just refer to it occasionally Fortitudo is one of the four principal attributes that Fiori thinks fighters need, and it is specifically the stability of one's position. And uh, whenever one is connected to the earth, one has options. So the first thing that ha is happening with this play is the enemy's Fortitudo is being taken away, and without Fortitudo, what opportunity is there for them to counter? There's, there's none. They can't. So unless this is stopped, unless this is reacted to um, quickly, it admits of no counter. Okay, next one. Poke to the ear. Poke to the ear. Can um, C, uh, CC66, who's CC66? If you'll forgive me. Huh, some mystery person. Okay, a uh, uh, Curran, would you like to read this one? Sure. Um, oh, I'm sorry, so... let me scroll to the text, yeah. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Uh, I'm pressing my thumb against your ear, giving you so much pain that you'll go to the ground without a doubt. Or else I'll do another grapple or bind that will be worse than torture. The counter performed by the sixth play against the fifth, in which the hand is placed under the elbow, may be done against me without a doubt. Awesome. Okay, cool. So, this is a neat one. This is a neat one. Um, so, first of all, what we see here is we see we get introduced to the notion of pain compliance. Okay, pain compliance is an important notion in martial arts, um, but it's it's important to know what it is and what it isn't. So strictly speaking, pain compliance is the act of inflicting physical discomfort, pain on someone in order to encourage a certain reaction. Okay, so, you know, punching somebody in the face, punching them in the chest or in the in the liver um, you're not expecting to kill them with those punches. You're not expecting their heart to explode and them to fall down dead. So if someone's trying to kill you, punching them in the liver, punch them in the face, it's not going to kill them. So why would you do it? 
Well, you might do it because you might think that if you give pain to your enemy, the pain might, the accumulation of pain might either slow them down and allow, or make it easier for you to kill them, or it might change their mind about killing you. So pain compliance is that sort of thing. Okay. Now, some things are more pain compliance than others. For example, striking, striking with your hands and you know, your legs, uh, your arms and your legs, your elbows, whatever. Striking can kill. However, it doesn't, it's not uh, usually a quick kill. So st if you strike to the vulnerable places like the back of the neck or the throat, maybe to rup rupturing an artery or, um, you know, it's hard to kill someone with strikes. It's hard to kill someone with strikes. But strikes cause a lot of pain and discomfort. Um, I was, um, I uh, one of our other free scholars at Toronto, Aldo, gave me a concussion a few years ago. Um, and I've never forgotten it. <laughs> and I, I don't get concussions very often. But, um, you know, pain, uh, certain kinds of pain, and especially the kinds of pain associated with um, being struck with legs and, and fists, it really, it's really shit. It's just terrible, right? And unless you're some sort of like bruiser, you know, uh, type of person where you've been hit so much you don't feel feel like you're hit anymore. Usually people don't like being hit. However, pain compliance has a critical requirement. And the requirement is that the thing you're doing causes pain that's registered to the other person. And pain is a very, very tricky thing in human beings. It's possible for people to become immune to pain by toughness. It's also possible for people to psychologically reject pain purely with their by a mental decision, even if it's overwhelming. And so the problem with pain compliance as a whole is that it's untrustworthy as an as a tool to preserve your life. It can work for you, but sometimes it won't. And everything that you do when you're fighting takes time. You're paying time to get something done. So pain compliance is one of those things that you could pay time for and have it not give a return. It might not necessarily do anything for you. It might actually make your situation worse. If this person tried to poke this person in the ear and this person was a tough sort and didn't care whatsoever, they would use that time that they're poking them in the ear to do something else, right? And that, that, that thing might end up finishing the fight and killing the scholar. So as a general concept, pain compliance is one of the things that is um it's tricky right it's tricky it's subtle and you need to know what it is and what it isn't okay as a fighter one of the things that you 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 work to inculcate is you work to inculcate a personal distinction between pain and injury with respect to you defending yourself injury makes it physically difficult to defend yourself because injury means that some of your body parts aren't working. And you're going to need them to work to, to perform martial arts. Pain is irrelevant in that, you know, if you're, someone's trying to kill you and they, you get punched in the face, you get, you get a superficial cut on the arm or the chest or something like that, you would prefer to be the kind of fighter that still continue to successfully and fully use all of their limbs when they were all working, even if there may be other pains and discomforts going on at the same time, right? Um, so uh, it's important to point out that not only is pain compliance an unreliable tool to use on others, but pain is one of the things that um, a f fighters actively attempt to train themselves to sustain without a loss of um, functionality or competence in the fight. Okay. Now with respect to Emma's training, Emma doesn't put a lot of emphasis on this particular aspect of being a fighter in that, or, or principally because it's very personal and, um, everyone is more than welcome to work on this particular aspect, uh, as much as they wish. 
but usually the more and more intense fighting you get, the more opportunity you get a chance to work on this aspect of being a fighter. Um, so as in the recruit program, it's not something that's really important, um, but you'll get lots of opportunity to work on your own tolerance of pain and discomfort uh, the more you start to fight and the higher up an Emma you get, and the more you start getting hit. Now, why did I go, go on this um, big sort of um, explanation? Well, pain compliance in grappling, there's actually, um, there's a bunch of different plays in the grappling section which have pain uh, pain is their principal uh, product. Okay. The ear push is one. Um, the knee to the balls is the next one. Um, the face, no, that's mechanical. And the eye, the eye gouge is another. Okay. So the eye, the eye gouge, the knee to the balls. And the ear poke are specifically pain compliance plays, as opposed to all of the other plays in this section, which are principally mechanical. Right? The product that is coming through with this action is a mechanical, substantial change to the fortitudo of the fighters, to the stability of the fighters. Okay, often resulting in a throw. Um, the one exception to that might be the f first and second play, where uh, you're you might get a throw from this play because this person might throw themselves to the ground to avoid an arm break, but the principal product of this initial action is to seek an arm break, a straight arm break, high um, on the person. But this isn't a pain compliance play, of course, because an arm break, whether or not it causes pain, injures the enemy and effectively limits or reduces their ability to to harm you. So this is not a pain compliance play, although, of course, all of these may cause pain. This third play here should be done explosively, as we talked about. This person should look the way they look in the picture, which is very, <laughs> very uh, discomfort. So... In this series of um, unfortunate events, in this series of different situations in grappling, this is our the first one, which is specifically a pain compliance play. Okay, he's he's putting the elbow, sorry, he's putting the uh, the the elbow, the thumb, um, right underneath the jaw, under the ear, where there's a nerve cluster, and pressing. And by the look of the picture, this person's turning away from the pain which could give him maybe the first play of grappling. It could give him maybe a throw. It could give him an escape. Who knows, right? But it's really affecting the structure of this of this person, okay? Um, and all of this that I've said is, seems to be corroborated by Fury. He says, giving you so much pain that you go to the ground without a doubt or else, dot, 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 I'll do another grapple or bind to you. That will be worse than torture. <laughs> He also says that the elbow push that we saw just a moment ago, the elbow push counter can be done to this scholar. So remember how I said elbow pushes usually come from below when the arm is high? We see here that the enemy who's being having pain inflicted upon them, their arm is underneath the scholar's arm. So an elbow push is, uh, as a counter is possible. Okay? Um, so much for that play. Moving on. The escape from behind, 7VA. Can... Uh, Dimitri, can you give us a go? Uh, yes. Do I have sound? Yep. All right. Uh, you grab me from, be from behind to throw me to the ground, and I'm turned like this. Yes, see the picture. Consider yourself lucky if you're not the one ending up on the ground. If this play is performed quickly, the counter won't succeed. Okay, so this is an escape from behind play. I actually just saw a judo school do this play in a random, random video on YouTube uh, a day or two ago. This is a very common escape 
um, in grappling arts from a grab from behind. And like we've talked about before, we have to understand that these pictures are, um, these images are not pictures taken by camera. They're um, a moment in time and of a complex martial arts action, they're only one moment, right? So the moment of this action we see here is before this person stepped over, stepped behind themselves. This person was completely behind this person. So this person was facing this way, and this person had just come up and grabbed them under their arms from behind. So what the scholar did in reaction is the scholar stepped behind himself over the lead leg of the enemy and he put his leg behind his leg, sunk his weight, and he also put his arm in a reverse boar's tooth position over his shoulder. After this position is achieved, the, scho the scholar is going to do something called a um, volta stabile with their, their footwork, and that will finish the throw and cause this opponent to go to the ground. Okay. Um, all of the footwork, we're going to see this, this later, but I mentioned footwork, so I might as well mention it here. All of the footwork that we teach in Emma comes principally from one paragraph only, and it's only briefly mentioned. And that paragraph is in the, the sword in two hands section. And it's the preface. Um, it's not, um, it's not, no, 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 it's not here. Uh, where is it? No, where is it? Oh, it's to the, oh, it's to the, ah, to the guards. That's where it is. Okay, yes, here we go. It's the, so, um, I'm just going to pick out the text for you. So, in this paragraph, which is folio 22R, A and B, Fiore says, when talking about how swords can move, um, oh, anyway, uh, he says, um, blah, blah, blah. Here are the guards. What one guard can do, its opposite can do. These guards can perform a volta stabile and a mezza volta. A volta stabile lets you play forward or backward from one side only without moving your feet. And a mezza volta is when you pass forwards or backwards. So you can play on the opposite side forwards or backwards. A tutta volta is when you use one foot to describe a circle around the other foot. In other words, one foot stays in place and the other circles around it around it. The sword also has three three movements. Volta stabile, mezza volta, and tutta volta. This is one of the most important paragraphs in the book by far. By far. And there's a lot here. We're not going to deal with it today. We're going to get to it when we get to it. But the footwork that Emma recruits begin to learn on day one comes from academic work uh, arising directly from this paragraph, principally, supported by data points noticed throughout the manuscript. Okay? So, um, anyway, back to this, back to this play here. Um, I already described the action. Fiore says, again, if this play is, uh, well, he says something about the counter not being able to succeed. He says, if this play is performed quickly, the counter won't succeed. So there again, if you're able to, I mean, it's kind of like saying nothing. If you're able to do it, then he can't stop you. <laughs> but um, we can take Fury's admonishment to be, um, if you do this right away and strongly, then the counter is difficult for the enemy to, um, enemy to make. And again, principally because one of the first things you're doing when you step back behind him is you're robbing him of their fortitudo. Not completely, but significantly. 
whereas the, the Volta Stabile is going to finish the throw that you've already started by stepping behind and sinking your, your weight. Okay? But um, there you go. It, it, isn't that interesting? And again, this is a very common situation in grappling, getting grabbed from behind. Um, although, it shouldn't be common if you only have one opponent. Um, this sort of situation, being grabbed from behind, uh, if you've only had one opponent and they grabbed you from behind, you fucked up in a huge way. Someone dastardly wrong. That's a really bad situation. But if you're in a multiple opponent situation, th this might not be helped. Or this might, this might not be able to be helped. So um, there's an open question going through the book about um, to what degree Fiore is talking about self-defense versus fighting on a battlefield or vice versa or... When is he talking about one and not the other? Could we read him as talking about civilian self-defense if we wanted? Did he have it on his mind, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Things that are common to see in multiple opponent situations could show us that he had this in mind, that, that he had civilian self-defense situations um, in mind. And being grabbed by a friend from behind is one of those things. Okay. Next, the Gambarolo, or so it's colloquially named. Uh, Graham, would you like to give us the text for this one? Sure thing. Uh, this is a trip up, which is never a safe action in Abuzare. Still, if you want to trip someone, do so strongly and quickly. Okay. So, first of all, the play. So, bef before this um, scholar did this action, and the action was they stepped through, they stepped over this guy's right leg. They stepped over the leg behind him. Okay. Before the scholar did that, um, the, the scholar and the enemy were in a classic cross-body uh, grappling, a close grappling situation. Okay. Um, the only more classic that it could get is if they were in a head and arm situation where um, one person's hand is on the other person's neck and the um, and your other arm is on their bicep. And that's and both people are like that. That's one of the most classic wrestling positions of all time, um, since going back to the Greeks and I'm sure till the first human beings. Um, so this began as a classic head and arm, close grappling, no space between the chests. And this uh, um, furious scholar has tried this trip up. Uh, Gambarola is the is the name. Um, I think this is how Leone translates this as trip up. Uh, is is um is Andrew here? Uh, shoot, Andrew's not here. Does anybody have a copy of um of uh, Leone and uh, Mele's new translation of the Getty? No, I gotta get myself a copy of those. Anyway, Gambarola uh, is. Are we are talking about that book? Yeah, yeah. That uh, hardcover book. Yeah, that one. Do you have a copy of that one? I think so. If you don't mind finding the the translation for Gambarola in the text, this is Folio Seven VB. Okay. Um, I so just... we are talking about the book. That's like. Uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 the Is that one? Yeah, the hard the hard one. Yeah, the hardcover okay. one. Yeah. Give me a moment to find it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, okay, uh, so, oh, do you have it with you? Yeah, it's oh, just, so. it, it still calls it a trip up. Trip up, okay, for, fine, great. All right. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so here's Gambarolo. Um, so that's that's basically the play. Um, it's pretty conventional. There's a, there's a few little things you can do to make it, uh, uh, make it a little less unsafe, but we can't really talk about those unless we're on the floor. Uh, Fiori says two, gives us two big pieces of information. He says, this is never safe in Abrazari. <laughs> okay. And, and then he says, but if you do it, you better do it strongly and quickly. So first of all, uh, never safe in Abrazari. Um, that seems pretty strong. Um, this, this text here, never safe in Abrazari, flies in the face of the vast majority of wrestling by Emma students that I've ever seen or 
been part of because this is something very common that we do um, not least because it's very it's very uh, it's a very safe and it seems like it's a very you know basic way to try and trip somebody in wrestling it's not even going to be that hard of a, th a, a fall a fall either so yeah, people do this all the what, time mm -hmm. i think what uh, i think uh, it's meant is that it's never safe for the person who's doing it in other words it could be used against him right there oh, at the same yeah time. that's uh, that's correct they, yeah that's what i meant yeah and maybe yeah. that's what it's meant it's not that, that the safety of the person as, as to how much damage you're going to do is the, the fact oh. that you might not be able to pull it off yes it's, so it's not a safe something to do because somebody else will do it to you so that's why he says do it quickly Correct, and that's uh, yes, and thank you for clarifying that because that's what I'm I intended to comment on. M what I intended to say is, despite the fact that this is what he means by this is that it's not safe for the scholar to do. That's what he means. But despite that fact, we do this all the time. So um, one of the things that I think we can take from this, and you know, if I had to teach all recruits again, if, if I had to teach everybody again from the ground up, I would say. You know, this is one of those avert your eyes sort of plays. Like, acknowledge it. It's a thing. Don't do it. Don't do it because it's really unsafe. And I'll explain that a little bit more in a minute. But secondly, if you're going to do it, do so quickly and strongly. This is less of an admonishment as I read it and more of a warning about what you ought to expect when someone does it to you. So why is it never safe, right? Why is it not too safe? Why is it never safe? Right, this is a legit question. Fury doesn't contextualize. Why it's not safe is that in order to get this throw, you have to give up something. And as a general rule, Fury's style of fighting is to never give anything to get anything. Fiore, in, in most conventional readings, and I'd certainly say in mine, Fiore is a very boring, conservative fighter. He doesn't take risks. He doesn't, do, he doesn't um, play games. He doesn't give you anything, the opponent anything. He just does his thing and, and um, you know, he, he, he goes into the position, finds the, finds the place and tries to kill you, tries not to get hit. This act, he says it's a trip up, okay? This trip up, Gamborola, this does not mean this position. This is a class of actions. Every action, regardless of the weapon set, where you are going to sacrifice your own fortitudo for the chance no matter how certain you are, for the chance at gaining some advantage, that is a gambarolo. And that is what makes this unsafe. It's because this scholar has to step across this person's leg. And while that foot is moving, he only has one foot on the ground. And any wrestler worth their salt will feel that. A thousand, thousand percent. So there's a, it's a long way to Tipperary when you're making this entry. A long way. And this isn't an increasing step. This isn't a shuffle. This isn't even a volta stabile. This is a passing step over their leg. So this leg is the lead, is the, the trailing leg before it starts. And it becomes the lead. This is a very... A positionally aggressive action and it by necessity gives up fortitudo for a chance at getting something so that's why it's unsafe um you guys will make your own calls but i read this as strongly commenting on the concept in general i see this confirmed and reconfirmed throughout the text but um, you know, I just, this is one of these interesting little nuggets that you don't really realize how important it is until you actually look at it. Um, you know, we're never in the book. We're never going to give anything to get anything. And, you know, whenever I feel like maybe learning a few tricks, 
Um, I have always, I remember this play and uh, I, you know, I, I, all of a sudden I don't want to anymore, right? Fury is not about tricks, um, though, though of course they can be done, but usually tricks in martial arts, um, usually tricks are the kind of thing where if they work, you get something. If they fail, you lose something. And if you're ever doing something in martial arts where that's the situation, you're doing, st you're doing something that is in some degree some kind of gambarola. And it's important to be conscious of that fact. That's not a value judgment on it. It's not to say that it's not great when it works. Everything is great where it works. But it's, it's um, very bad to think the opposite. To do something that is a gambarola and not know that it's gambarola is very bad for you. And you can end up in being countered in some surprising and uh, shameful ways. <laughs> and the, the, the counter to this um, is, uh, is classic because as you step across to do this wrestling play, you've literally put the enemy into a gambarola on you. And he can just volta stabile and throw you to the ground when you're mid-step. So a really, you know, de doy uh, emotion. Um, but of course, if it does work, you can throw people right on their ass, and isn't that cool? All right, um, I think that's it for this one. Moving on. Okay, the escape, or the, um, the full Nelson. Folio 7VC. Who's next on the list? Uh, uh, Graham. Which, oh, no, I called him already. Mark. Mark Northeast, would you like to read the text? This situation is fairly unusual way to grapple someone in a way he won't be able to defend. And here's the counter. If you are the one being held this way, go as soon as you can against a wall or other structure and turn around so that the opponent holding you will break his head or back against it. <laughs> this is... This is one of the best plays in the book for sure. <laughs> you know, why why did you bother to put pen to paper fury? Like what well, thanks thanks for all the help and masterful instruction. Okay, so so here we go. We we have a situation where um let's put the family comparison up here. I think this is an L. Yeah, yeah. So we have a situation where um someone's been placed in a full Nelson. What's colloquially known as a full Nelson. And where is, um, or uh, which is, uh, one person has reached underneath the arms of the other person from behind and put both of their hands together on the back of their neck. So the first thing to say here is that if we were looking for evidence that Fiore might have multiple opponent situations in mind, we might consider this play as an additional data point, principally because this is not that useful of a position for the person doing it um, if they're trying to kill somebody. Okay. Um, the, both of your hands are occupied behind their neck. You're trying to reduce the space to prevent the use of their arms and make and get this position so tight that they can't counter your lock behind them so that you have them in your power you have their core or their their spine in in your power they can't counter you but now what you got that's all you got so if you were trying to kill them that's not going to work but what it does do is it perhaps makes it a lot easier for your buddy to fill them full of holes with their dagger or start doing the, you know, the, um, the punching bag sort of training, the, the, the rocky stuff. So this is something that um, you might see again in a multiple opponent situation where one person manages to get behind the enemy and hold them for their friend. However, Fiore says this is, very un this is a fairly unusual way to grapple someone. And he doesn't make mention of multiple opponents, so maybe he's really just talking about single opponents. And he's saying, well, you know, I told you I was going to talk about common stuff. 
this isn't really that common, but I'm going to talk about it anyway. So, okay, fine. Fiore, you're gonna, we're going to talk about it. What's your piece of advice? And his piece of advice is find a wall <laughs> or other structure and give him the old Fezzik. Right? That's a Princess by reference for anybody on the call. Uh, bang him against the wall. So, uh, you know, there's not much to add. Um, strictly speaking... Um, except perhaps a complaint that he didn't even add the friggin' wall. And we know he's perfectly capable of drawing structures into his plays because in the final play in the book, he draws a nice castle and gives us this parting Fiore quip, I see you running away to your fortress and I chase after you and I stab you and I run away before your friends get here. <laughs> this, is, this is this is an amazing play. What a way to end the end the book. But he's clearly he's clearly uh, he can clearly draw structures. So what I want to know is where is our wall? Right? No wall, nothing. Okay, fine. So how to understand this play? Well um, all that being said um, while this does seem a bit silly, um, we have to remember that Fiore does leave out more than he puts in. So, okay, fine. We'll take Fiore seriously out for his word. If we have a structure, convenient, and as the person who's, been, who's being a um, full Nelson, we can still move them around somehow, we'll, we, we will try to push them up against the wall and crack their head on it or whatever fine um that's a potential solution there are others and when we train this in the cell there, we're going to teach you some more conventional solutions to this play um one of which is to uh, not let this hold get so tight so that you can sink your elbows down and once you've broken the grip on the back of the neck then you can try the escape from behind play that we just saw. And it works perfectly fine. Another potential counter, if you're too late to this play, and they've already set it, is you can reach behind your head and grab onto fingers and start ripping. And if you can find the, the, the hand that's above, right? If you can find the above hand, find a finger, or two and rip them back you can potentially break the grip that way and that will allow you to, to sink your waist or uh, sink your core sink your elbows and then you can try the escape from behind play that we saw earlier so though fiore does not tell us um ways to defeat this this scenario that seem useful um, though he doesn't tell us about the, how to do that in this text, in this play, he's shown us already some ways to get around it. So we can we can do that instead. Okay? And we know that we're at least in the ballpark. I'm sure Fiori wouldn't object to that. Because we're doing what he said. Um, next play. Folio 7VD, the old knee of the knackers. Uh, Renat. This one is hitting the opponent in the balls to be in a better position to throw him to the ground. And here's a counter. As your opponent lifts his knee to hit you, grab his leg with your right hand from under his knee and throw him to the ground. All right. So um, recalling what we talked about, about pain compliance, um, pain compliance has an additional utility in um in martial arts pain compliance can be useful to build a tempo advantage so um we're going to talk about we end up talking about tempo we usually introduce tempo to recruits when we in the context of swordsmanship um, but tempo is a universal concept it applies to everything and the easiest way to, to to describe it, I guess, would be to would be to, to, to say this. Each person each person's motions 
right? Each person has a body and each person can move their body. And every time a person moves their body, the movement that they're doing takes an objective amount of time in seconds or milliseconds or whatever. If a person is moving alone, then there is no tempo because there's no relationship between that person and, a, and an enemy, right? You can't fall, you can't, um, you can't be ahead in time, you can't be ahead in tempo or behind in tempo if you're just yourself. You can move your limbs infinitely without any cost. But as soon as two individuals start fighting, then we have this thing called tempo. And tempo is a way to describe the relationship between the objective motions of one individual and the objective motions of another. And um, what we mean when we say ahead or behind in tempo, and we use, we use the words time and tempo interchangeably in this, in this context. Um, when you're ahead in tempo, you are causing the enemy to react to you because the enemy ostensibly has a care for their own life. So if you begin, say like you say you're, you know, you begin a, a fencing match, you attack somebody. The first actor, the agent, what's called the agent, they've done something which has threatened the life of, of, the, of their opponent and their opponent is going to react. So when, um, so it, it, whenever there's, there's a set of two people fighting, usually someone's ahead and someone's behind. Someone's acting and someone's reacting. That can change a lot and the tempo can even out so that no one's ahead and no one's behind for a moment. Um, and often in a fight, the tempos change all the time. But, um, but that's what we mean when we say tempo, okay? The relationship between two people's physical actions. Now, pain compliance is a um, common tool to use to increase your tempo advantage. So if I'm ahead, if I'm attacking somebody, I'm ahead in time, I'm forcing them to react to me, and then I poke them in the eye, and I knee them in the balls, and I punch them in the face, and then I try the first play on them. All of that pain compliance, what it's done, it hasn't actually finished my enemy, it hasn't done anything to them per se, but it's caused them pain and consternation such that it's made them fall behind in their reactions to me. And it's given me an opportunity to do the thing I wanted to do. Whereas if my opponent wasn't in pain and they were fully concentrating on what I was doing, they could very easily tell what I was doing and stop it. So pain compliance is actually a critical part of martial arts in, it's a basic part of martial arts in that if we're fighting someone and we're not causing them pain and discomfort, then we're being like excessively polite. We're being like, you know, British BBC level polite. <laughs> I don't know what the highest level of polite is. Maybe, you know, I don't know. Uh, I'm searching for a cultural stereotype and thinking I shouldn't. Polite, super polite. Okay. Canadian. Canadian level polite. Oh, Lordy. Oh, Lordy, Lordy. Right. Um, one of the reasons why wrestling is um, such a, um, an enjoyable activity, mostly, um, is because people rarely wrestle with pain compliance. Usually people wrestle where everybody's just paying attention to what the hell is going on. No one's punching each other in the face. No one's poking each other in the eyes or grabbing people in a way that's painful, right? People are just grabbing on each other and paying attention. And in that context, wrestling is very difficult because everything you do can be noticed, felt, and countered, right? But if you're if you have pain compliance wrapped up into your play, your wrestling, then wrestling doing simple things becomes a lot harder. Noticing things becomes a lot harder. And this knee in the balls play, it is a play unto itself, although, you know, one might ask why even bother showing it. I mean, obviously that's a thing. 
But it's a class of thing where it's showing us that we can build time, we can build a tempo advantage in Abrazari, and of course, in every other aspect as well. Abrazari is the pillar of all of the other sections, as we read. We can use this to build time to make things more likely to succeed. So this play simultaneously not only um, gives us more information about what pain compliance is, but it also reveals a bit of the, more of the character of the kind of fight that we're in and the kind of thing that we're trying to do, right? We're aiming, if we're aiming to do the fighting that was in this book, we're aiming to strategize and put into effect the kind of fight that Fiore is showing us. And this fight that Fiore is showing us includes pain compliance. Now, as I said before, pain compliance is not a large experience as a recruit, not intentionally anyway. There's lots of pain involved in martial arts training as a, a necessary matter, of course. But this isn't a major experience involved with recruits. But this is something that becomes more and more important as you get more and more advanced. And it is incumbent on all scholars and free scholars and such to attempt a state of affairs where they're comfortable allowing their partner to try things like pain compliance. Because this is what we're trying to add into our, this is, this is the thing we're studying. Right. We want to we want to have habits that induce pain compliance on our, on our enemy. We don't want to have habits when we're completely polite and milk toast and never offend each, our enemy at all, except when we tap them on the mask with the tip of our sword. Right. That's not the fight we're learning. But my point is that this experience is one of those things that is uh, more and more uh, uh, seen in higher levels. Um, and it's something that needs to be in those higher levels because it needs to be built up. Um, the pain experience at Emma is very, very generous. It's very small and everyone gets to take as much of it as they want to. But um, the, the latter is very clear and you get a great opportunity to experience more and more of this kind of thing safely the longer you're in Emma and the higher um, that, you, uh, that you train up. And that's always something that we've done very well. Um, you know, back in the day, we often tell stories about back in the day at Emma, there used to be a lot more direct teaching on this aspect than there is now, but it was always done um, by people who know the difference between pain and injury. And Brian and um, Dave Svat and all of our original, um, you know, our original free scholars and um, provosts, they know that very well. And it's important in our education, even though it's unpleasant most of the time. Moving on, what's after the knee in the balls play? If my internet will cooperate. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, we have the face push. Who is next? Um, Tingish. Would you like to read the text for this one? Uh, it, it, is it okay if I pass? Sure, absolutely it is. Absolutely it is. Um, it's it's yep. wonderful to hear from all of you. Yep, no, no problem. I'm just going through the list if you want to. You don't have to. You don't have to read by any means. Uh, Amber, would you like to read the text? Thanks, Aaron. No problem. Yeah, sure. Okay, give it a whirl. If you have grappled me with your arms under mine, I'll put both my hands against your face. Although, if you wore good armor. I would be lost with this play. Here is the counter. The student who is hit in the face should put his right hand under the opponent's left elbow and then push strongly and free himself. All right. So here's this grapple and the counter is an elbow push. I told you we'd see it a lot. And sure enough, we have. So first of the first thing we're going to note is the counter Fiore is saying to this is an elbow push. Well, again, what we said, or what we saw before, elbow pushes often occur from below, where an arm comes up and gets the elbow. Sure enough, the person being pushed, their hands are below. They're in a double under grab. So an elbow push counter, very natural. 
um, because the human body has two arms, in situations like this, you might have a choice of which elbow to push. You will usually go for the lead elbow because the lead leg, uh, the, the, the elbow on the lead leg uh, side, because that will oftentimes give you an opportunity to get behind somebody. Whereas if you're inside their position, like these guys are, if you were to push the left elbow at the end of the push, even if it was successful, he wouldn't be behind this person. But elbow elbow push counter, fine, um, pretty pretty easy. Okay, can I ask a question? Yes. Why does Fury bring up armor in this case when like other pain compliant? Like if I was wearing a helmet, you couldn't do the ear thing. And if I was wearing like, you know, a, a good crotch pad, you couldn't do the kick to the nuts either. Excellent Maybe. question. Why isn't Fury consistent? <laughs> That's essentially what you're asking, right? And, you know, the answer, uh, the simple answer to that is who the hell knows? Um, I, I definitely don't know. Um, what we can say is that it seems, well, first of all, um, Fiore seems to be encouraging us, and we, we've read this, um, we've seen this on a number of times throughout the session so far, Fiore is encouraging us not to fall into the trap that just because these figures are, are unarmored, right, that he's talking about unarmored wrestling. The what they have on has nothing to do, uh, excuse me has nothing to do with it. He's talking about something which he explicitly says underpins every other weapon system, and that includes in full armor on horseback. Okay, um, lest anyone doubt that there is a significant amount of grappling in the hor in the uh, section. On horseback even unarmed grappling so this really truly so the, the, the abrazari section underpins everything why does fury sometimes talk about armor and sometimes not um who knows but probably to emphasize it where he thinks it's needed so you know why does he make those individual choices? It's not clear, right? Well, and, we can hypothesize. But in this case, he seems to want to say, um, if you wore good armor, this is this is useless. But but uh, even in that context, I'm not really sure I understand, because if right. you're wearing good armor, like the head can be pushed even, even in armor. Excellent question. Excellent question. So again, you ask, so what does he mean? By say, if you if you wore good armor in this in this case, if you wore good armor, I would be lost with this play. What might he mean? Well, I agree with you 100% that this is clearly this kind of a throw, the throw that seems to be setting up a push of the face, maybe with a trap of an arm to the waist, and a, maybe a fourth or fifth play sheer or throw like we've seen just previous. This seems to be eminently reasonable. What's what's the deal? One answer might lie in the translation of the um, of this word here, hit. So, um, man, I don't know enough uh, of the. I don't know enough of, of Italian to give a good answer here. However, one thing we know intuitively is that armor does mitigate the effect of strikes though it doesn't mitigate the effect of grappling, of Abrazari. So if someone had good armor on the face, then a percussive blow to the face with both palms might not be useful, especially if it give, puts you at risk of an elbow push. But if he didn't have armor on his face, a percussive a shot to the, the, the front of the face might be eminently useful to set up something else. So my, my guess to, uh, to answer your question, that's what I, I, I think he's saying. I think he's making that comment with respect to the notion that this is a percussive blow to the face and good armor would prevent that from being effective. That's my guess. What do you, what do you think? Do you have another theory? I guess like uh, what kind of armor was popular in Italy around the time? Maybe like 
because like, this seems to imply that the, the head is turning and like we often sure. go flip the uh the chin when, when this happens and maybe if it's like a very bulky helmet that's uh sort of doesn't allow for a lot of neck movements that might not be allowed yeah um it's a, it's a good question um we're not going to get too much into the weeds of this um but, but uh very uh, very common uh armor was a bassinet at the time so we look we look in the in the armored section um we see we see some frogs here um we see some bassinets with visors on so a, a bassinet is for those for those people who don't know it's just this helmet part of the helmet here right and you know the typical sort of knight's quote unquote knight's helmet is uh, is going to be a bassinet with a visor of some kind and we usually identify the helmets by the nature of the visor so um, you might have a hound's a hound's skull visor on a bassinet you might have a a flat faced visor on a bassinet um uh So here's here's a bunch of bassinets from from best armor. What you're going to see is that um, can, can everybody see my screen? I think yes. Okay, great. Um, so what you're going to see is is just what I'm describing. So we have this basic bassinet uh, style, um, and we have a visor of some kind. So if we look through these, um, you know, some of these that are open faced, maybe you could get something percussive through. Everything that's got some some major closed face. There's a barboot, an Italian barboot. Um, closed face stuff is going to make strikes um, unlikely to be. Uh, this is SCA uh, uh, stuff. Um, these are some more open face stuff. Uh, I think the one that the one that I want is this one. I think this is going to be my helmet. It's so awesome. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Enough about that. We're going to get lost in the eyes of the armor. Um, yeah, open faced, closed faced, depends on the armor. I think that's all he's trying to say. May I also ask a question? Please. Not to spend too much time on this one, but in my translation, it says even if you were well armored, this would still make you let go. So oh. somehow it's got the absolute opposite meaning. This is the uh, Colin Hatcher translation. Okay, and so um, this is a good point. I'm glad you, you brought that up. This is a good point to stress to everyone on the call why having multiple translations is important. Not only to catch um, con uh, conflicts in the translations, but also to check to see whether or not you're putting too much faith in a translation that you're using. So for example, um, uh, what makes a translation good is a combination of linguistic expertise and also an intimate familiarity with the subject matter that's being translated. That's the best case scenario. The, as far as I'm aware, the best case scenario translations for Fiore are by Tom Leone who is has the academic linguistic expertise par excellence as far as i i'm aware of anyone who's tried to translate this stuff and he also has uh more than a passing understanding of fencing and fury although he's not a furiest as such he's never been a fury a student of fury as such as, as i understand it there's no one else who ha um who, who gets close is, is in my understanding. So Colin Hatcher, Colin Hatcher is, ha, has made an effort of it. And this isn't me shitting on Colin Hatcher or anything like that, right? God forbid he watches this video when it's on YouTube. But this is just to say that, this is just to say that um, you, you know, there's lots of free translations out there on tons of stuff, like the Wichtenhauer. If any, if any of you haven't, um, um, uh, Wichtenhauer. Uh, how many, I'm gonna I'm gonna butcher this. Here we go. If any of you haven't looked at the Wichtenhauer, you definitely should. The Wichtenhauer is an amazing resource. It's you know tons and tons of HEMA manuscripts are here, with their images and with 
um, provisional translations, some even great translations. But you do not want to make the mistake in thinking that just because there is a translation of something that it actually does translate the material much less well. Okay, one of the reasons why um, HEMA is such a difficult topic and to this day is almost untouched in professional academia. And I cannot stress that enough as someone who attempted to do it. <laughs> almost untouched. One of the reasons why it's almost untouched is because you need to both have the linguistic expertise in strange old languages, but you also need to be physically fit and a martial artist and practicing a, a, a practicing HEMA student, usually studying the source that you're translating. So for context, that's a very tall order. So if you get a translation of someone like that, then great. If you don't have one like that, then you should you should look at all the translations um, with one eye only, right? At the side of your eye, be very suspicious. Now, um, Tom Leone and Greg Mele's new book, the reason why that book is great for Furious is because it combines um, Leone's technical expertise in the tr in linguistic translation with Greg Mele and Sean Hayes's familiarity with Fiore. Greg Mele and Sean Hayes are um, Emma's sister schools in the States. They um, began the Fiore project relatively the same time as Brian and, uh, and Dave Svet. And so I would highly recommend their translations specifically as your go-to and everyone else's is provisional. Um, but again, that's just my opinion. Um, so my, my instinct there um, is to think that Colin Hatcher's translation is wrong, but obviously uh, as I can't corroborate it myself, because I, I don't know medieval Italian, um, maybe he's right. I'd have to get an expert to comment. Aaron? Yep. Uh, I'm, I'm just checking the like uh, the other two manuscripts, the mm -hmm. Parrot, the, the Pisani Dosi. Mm -hmm. There might be an answer because the Pisani Dosi and the Paris both said that, uh, like, uh, uh, Pisani Dosi said, I will give you so much pain and suffering to your nose. And Paris said, I will redouble so many pain, which your nose is suffering. So maybe the answer, if we assume Tom Leone is right, mm -hmm. uh, maybe what's happening is that this is like you're striking the other person's face. So of course, if you are wearing a helmet, this would not work. Yeah, yeah, that's a great or observation. I that's my right. instinct. That's that's my instinct. Yeah. The percent and the Paris both specifically mentioned that this is done to the nose. That is correct. That is correct. Although well, I, um, we, we haven't really talked about this too much, um, but the Paris and the Pisani Dossi are often going to agree, because it appears as if it's likely that the Paris is in some way down the line a relate, uh, uh, in relation to the Pisani Dossi. So ju I just want to make that quick point that when, when we look at the Paris and the, uh, uh, the Paris and the Pisani Dossi, when we see them agree, it's not like seeing the Getty and the Par uh, and the, and the PD agree. The Getty and the PD are distinct versions where they agree. That's interesting. That is, that is, Two distinct versions agreeing on something, but having the Paris and the uh, the Paris and the PD agree, it's not obvious how distinct they really are. So um, uh, you, we got to look at that with a grain of salt. But I absolutely agree, Zifeng. It seems like this is a percussive, a uh, blow to the face, with both with both hands. Okay. Um, now it's 9:44. Um, I'm going to continue with um, a few more of these plays, but um, I did kind of go over time a bit. Um, just Let's just kind of formally cap it um, and, then, and then we'll continue. So today um, we resumed looking at, uh, we resumed our study course by looking back at the Getty, starting with uh, Folio 7RB and the elbow push counter, the first counter in the grappling section. Um, we reprised a little bit of what we talked about in the last class with the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth play. And we talked about um, the seventh to the 13th play. So we got up to, um, in, the, in the normal time, uh, we got up to folio 8RA. Okay, um, maybe this is actually a good time to stop and take, take questions. 
uh, and see where we go for the last 15 minutes. So in the next section, uh, the, the next session, we're going to finish the grappling section. There's only a few more places to go. We're going to summarize the grappling section, and then we're going to move on to the bassoon cello section. Okay, so if you have to go, please go. I'm sorry for keeping you over. I didn't, didn't notice the time, um, but otherwise, maybe let's take some questions, or we'll continue a bit. Does anybody have any questions about what we've looked at so far? No? Okay. Um, silence is consent. If you do, please um, say so. Otherwise, um, we'll just going to continue. Okay? Maybe we'll just finish this up uh, tonight because we're almost there. Okay? Um, all right. So let's get back on track. What did we talk about? Um, here we talked about... Um, um, this play, we talked about ways to understand what Fiore is not saying. In this play, we talked about pain compliance as a class. We also talked about tempo. That was a lot. And in this play, we talked about um, different styles of helmets. We had a good question there. What is this play really? Um, Fiore does not really say explicitly that this is percussive, but he hints at um, he hints that it's percussive in the text of the counter description and also we have some corroborating evidence Zifeng kindly pointed out in the other manuscripts where it seems as if there's some notion of pain compliance or percussiveness so isn't that interesting okay also broadly i'm sure you guys have all seen have all sort of made this connection but if this is the case that this is kind of what it is then we have some fair, we have something fairly universal here where whenever somebody is double low on you right remember this play doesn't follow from the one before this is just a play plopped in here right whenever someone is double low on you and you're double high one of your principal opportunities is percussive actions to the face right and also um, keep in mind that even if you're in a close grappling situation this face can be pried off, space can be made, and strikes can be administered, right? So uh, this is this fits our intuition in terms of uh, general concept, right? What what he's doing here in grappling, pretty pretty basic stuff. There's a lot to talk about in that one. Um, okay, and again, we're talking about armor, right? We're, we're keeping armor in our minds. All of this grappling is going to be important in armor, which is the last half of the book, really. Okay, and the counter is the elbow push. All right, let's move on. All right, we have folio 8RB. We have a second counter uh, master. Um, uh, Zifeng, would you like to read this one? Sorry, I forgot I muted my mic. No so I perform the counter to the 13th play. The opponent's hand are now away from my face. Then the way I got him in a hold, I will be operate if he doesn't go to the ground. Okay. So he's performing the counter to the 13th play. So he's performing the counter to the play just previous that we just looked at. And he mentions the counter in the text already. He mentions that it's an elbow push. And then he shows it. So we've already talked about the elbow push. It's, you know, it's not, there's not much more to say since, since we're not on the floor. Although it does appear as if he's pushing the elbow on the lead, the lead leg side, which I, I noted earlier. Also, in this case, he's grabbing a leg. So broadly speaking, these leg grabs in Fiore, the context of them is when they come to you, not when you go to them. So there are there is a lot of grappling, uh, there are a lot of grappling techniques and other grappling arts where to some degree or another, the grappler will bend over or incline their posture in order to get a grasp of one of the pillars of the opponent's fortitudo. But Fiore will not do this. Or rather, 
he never says to do it in the text. And in the pictures, except for one case in the grap uh, in the in the dagger section, uh, in the fifth master of dagger, which will We'll just be very quiet about for now, because it's the exception that proves the rule. Except only in one case, any leg, uh, any leg shot, any leg grab that's seen is seen with a drawn with a straight back. So there's um, there's not a lot of seek of the you know scooping of legs. So how how are we to understand this play? Um, conventionally, we're to understand it that a stout elbow push was given across the center to the lead by the by the by the right hand here so he's using his right hand to elbow push the enemy's right hand and a stout elbow push created in this case the enemy was a stiff and his leg came up he he had his he had the weight pushed onto his back leg his front leg came up a bit and when the when the the countermaster's arm be, lying in uh, posta uh, porta de ferro came right to the leg and picked it up at the elbow. Then he's going to try and toss him. He's going to probably step through, try and toss him. And if he doesn't, he's going to do something else. Okay. Um, I'll be <laughs> I'll be greatly upset if he doesn't go to the ground. <laughs> Just, and I will throw a hissy fit if he doesn't go to the ground. What, I wonder what, with that. I wonder what that word "upset" means. It's just him being sassy. What is that word? Pren, prendero. Gra, no, grande dis, disgen, disdegno. That's probably what that is. Grande disdegno. <laughs> oh man. All right. Next play. Let's finish these off here. Uh, folio 8RC. I will read. So here we have a um, another push to the face. Um, if you grab someone with both your arms under his, let your hands go against his face as illustrated. And all the more if his face is uncovered. You could also enter the third play of Abrazare. All right. So a few things here. First of all, we saw in the previous plays that the guy who was double under is getting his <laughs> his face pushed in, all right? And this is a natural weakness about being double under. Okay, so Fury's told us about what to, some things to do when you're double over and the weakness of the elbow push. Okay, we've told... What about double under? What's something else that the double under guy can do other than elbow push? Well, it turns out there's tons of stuff, but Fury mentions one, and one of them which is go against his face yourself. Because, you know, screw him, right? Do do that thing to them. So so here we go. He's pushing the face. Because the arms are in the way, this is likely not a percussive action. Unlike this one. But um, as we talked about before, in armor or out of armor, this is going to disrupt the fortitudo, and it could lead to other stuff. Okay. Pushing the head back oftentimes breaks this grip. Okay, this is a fun. Uh, whenever the instructors get mean in Emma Toronto, we uh, we in a grappling class we can do this one because this really sucks to train. <laughs> but you get your you get your head smashed back, you know, and you're trying to grab onto the back of their neck, but you can't. So you you let go as soon as this grip is broken. You're already on the outside lead foot. Lead leg, uh, lead foot, lead leg, lead foot, lead hand. You're already on the outside, so you have a smashing opportunity to do with the third play of grappling. Um, tip, 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 tip. So you have a great opportunity to do, to do this guy. Okay, so there's really not much more to it than that. Um. The guy who's double under can go to the face as well. And he can use that disruption to get the third play. Okay. Um, also, if anyone... Sorry, does he yep. go uh, with both arms or just one? 
uh, with both. I, I mean, you know, <laughs> what does the picture show? The picture only shows one arm. But I, I, I presume conventional reading of this picture is to understand that the other arm is just on the other side in exactly the same place and you can't see it. Just like, technically speaking, the, the enemy is only shown with one arm too. You just get this little floating hand over here, right? Reminding us that he's got two arms. So uh, probably both arms. However, as with everything, um, there are variations. So could you get, could you, you know, improvise this with one hand? Probably. Right? That'd be something that we would practice on the floor. Okay. Um, last but not least, the last play of grappling already we have the eye gouge it's probably the nastiest one um, i am the counter to the 13th play so here we have this a series of three plays right one after the other which is important to note i'm the counter to the 13th play and if any other in abrazare where the opponent's hands are against my face if his face is open i put my thumb in his eyes if it is covered, I turn his elbow and follow quickly with a grappler bind. Whew. Wow. Okay. So last play of the grappling section. Sum it up for us, Fiore. What the hell are we talking about? Well, against any other play where the hands are in the face, you can do the eye gouge too. All right. So what? what's one? What's that? One, two, three, four, five. Uh six seven so you know almost half the plays in the grappling section this could potentially counter right anytime the hands are against the face fiore says well one thing you can do if he's going to put his hands on your face put your thumbs in his eyes with the implication that the action is to gouge them out and in the act of gouging Either he will stop what he's doing to stop you from gouging out his eyes and causing him blindness, or he'll let you do it, in which case you're you're going to solve your problem. Once he's blind, he won't be able to. He'll be uh, greatly reduced capacity to hurt you. Likely, it'll cause him so much pain and discomfort that he will stop. But remember, though blinding is a physical injury. You cannot count on the pain of anything to win the fight for you. So it's perfectly possible to have somebody who is, while their eyes are being gouged out, could kill you. Right? Um, I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm just getting through uh, watching the um, the World at War documentary by Laurence Olivier. Um, World War II has tons of stories of guy, uh, you know, of uh, soldiers who are enduring endure incredible personal suffering for a chance to kill their enemy you know um and do and survive right so that's just to stress the point that um i would consider this play to be another pain compliance play i don't believe it's a play that causes injury or wins the fight um i think it sets up a potential tempo advantage to get something else right um so, Aaron, yeah. isn't mm -hmm. the 13th play, isn't in the 13th play the um, person holding you below your arms? Um, good question. I'm the counter to the 13th play. So, I think you're right. Yep. Uh, 13th, play. 13th play. 13th play is this guy. So, the counter to the 13th play, so the guy who's pushing is the scholar. So, he's put, so in this case, the scholar's percussively um, attacked your face. So in the last play, the scholar would be this guy. This guy is going to counter this by trying to gouge out his eyes. So you can do elbow push, you can do 15th play, or you can eye gouge. Yep. Okay, thanks. Yep. That's that's pretty much it. So, you know, this last, this last, these last few things, you know, they, they're dealing principally with high grab grappling, right? High grab grappling, sort of like how this section began um this last bunch of stuff is pretty damn nasty percussive shots to the face 
Um, elbow push is obviously very simple. Eye ending with an eye gouge. Um, you know, common things to do in situations of life or death grappling. Okay, um, it is 10 o'clock. Um, we're definitely going to sum up the grappling section, but I think it's probably better to do it next session. We'll quickly uh, next session we'll quickly review the grappling section, kind of what, what 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 we looked at. Then we'll sum it up and we'll use that to kick us off for the bassinet cello section. Okay, um, I will um, pause now for a last moment for questions. I'll also invite um, I'll invite BD uh, to uh, give any commentary that he'd like on top of what I've said, and then we'll call it a, a day. So um, la uh, first things first, does anybody have any questions that they'd like to ask? Uh, Aaron? Yep. I just have, uh, can we go to the 14th plane? You know, the one that... Uh... The 14th? Yeah. Yep. Sorry. Oh, next one. Sorry, the other one. I think uh, I checked the Pasani Dosi again. Mm -hmm. uh, he said that the it seems that the push is to the chin. The get he just said, says that attack your face. So might be something important, but maybe not. Sure. Yeah. So, um, um... yeah, this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh... One of the things, so I'm, I'm in this, in the scholar sessions that we're doing right now, that some uh, Emma uh, Sal's are doing. Um, the scholar sessions are regularly looking to the other manuscripts to compare them, for just this reason, right? Comparing the translations, comparing the text, it's important, and it helps us contextualize on what we're looking at in the individual manuscript. That's the specific object of our study. So in this course, I said I'm going to be relying heavily on the Getty alone. We're not going to be doing too much. Uh, I'm not going to be going out of my way to compare them. Although, of course, you know, we would do that under conventional circumstances. But I do want to try and get through the book. But occasionally, it's a super, super useful, and it can help us confirm or deny suspicions we have. And uh, Zifeng, I think you're exactly right. Yeah, chin push um, with the with the throw. Yeah, chin push with a throw. Okay, um, if there are no more questions, um, uh, Abidi, uh, would you like to comment on uh, things that we've talked about today? Do you have anything to add or subtract? If you're talking, you're muted. <laughs> BD. BD. You might need to reset your mic because you're on not mute, but we're not hearing you. Yep. Yeah. Can't hear you, BD. Any moment now, his dulcet tones will come flowing in. <laughs> now? Oh, there he is. All right. You guys can, okay. Uh, yeah, so we've got five quick points. Um, in Guelph, we also look at the context of larger individuals versus smaller individuals and vice mm -hmm. versa. And our provost will look in the, the manuscript, and when we're training this, he'll say, yeah, sometimes you have to just tripod, as he puts it, like put your... Uh, your forehead into the other person's armpit and just stay in the wrestling, uh, uh, the close play until you find an opportunity. So that's sensitivity, using your sensitivity to find when there's a gap in the other person's fortitudo. That's one, uh, that's two components. Another one is striking at short range in order to gain the time in order to be able to do a play. So that's pain compliance as well as breaking somebody's mental fortitudo. Uh, another one that I'm fond of is rocking the car, mm -hmm. um, which is where we feed signal to the other person. We might push and then pull and then push and see how they respond. Mm. That allows us to go with it. Uh, for example, we might, if they if we pull them and they they pull them towards us and they pull back, mm -hmm. that might get us into a gambrola position. Mm. Uh, so those are some of the brief comments that uh, that came to mind during today's class. And of course, the context of doing this in armor as well. Yeah, I want to take. You which has been. Uh, sorry, BD, uh, uh, please continue. Sorry. 
Oh, no, I was just going to say the high center of gravity arm. Yeah. Well, I do want to take you up on one thing that you said. Um, uh, one of the things that Emma has always kind of been uh, quizzically uh, asked about, especially by new people, um, and even by experienced people every once in a while, is why we spend so much time uh, wrestling. Why we spend so much energy in the recruit program with grappling. Um, most people just want to get into the swordsmanship, so what's the big deal, right? And one of the reasons is because, you know, not only because Fury tells us, that would probably be enough, but um, there are so many critical aspects of swordsmanship that are actually easiest experienced and easiest learned in a, a grappling setting. And one of those is what BD mentioned, which is um, sensitivity. So the max, the, the maximally most sensitive uh, situation is when you're skin on skin. And that's when the mo the movement the, the 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 very smallest movement and change in the opponent you will feel directly and it won't even go to your uh, brain it'll bypass your brain you'll feel it you'll feel it and it's usually too quick to think about which is really what uh, uh, fencing is too quick to think about too but um, the easiest and most clear signals are in re are in wrestling. And a critical skill in fencing, one of the, the skill that arguably makes fencing fencing, is the ability to react in tempo to things you feel your opponent doing. Not things you see, not things you predict, but things you feel. And that feeling is going to come from their body through the whole length of their sword through the whole length of your sword, through your arm, and into your brain without being disrupted by anything else that's going on. And so the, the, the ability to practice, the chance to practice accurate sensitivity is, 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 is maximized in wrestling. And if you, can, if you can do it well in wrestling, you have a chance of doing it passably in uh, once you have a sword in your hand if you can't do it in wrestling you have absolutely no chance whatsoever of doing it at all passably with a sword in your hand and that 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 makes you effectively useless as a fencer and it, 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 it's 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 no um, more stark than that so all that is to say is that though it's extremely counterintuitive and it's counterintuitive to everyone. I, I only say this, having um, oh, believing it now, I only say this because I believe it because I have I was told that's how it was when I started at Emma 17 years ago or whatever, and then I experienced it being just that way. Um, and so it's for this reason that, um, you know, getting a chance to wrestle, getting a chance to experience wrestling at a high intensity is so useful an exercise to prepare you to f fence at a high intensity because the, the principal thing you're doing is you're training your innate skills of sensitivity of uh, you know you're training a whole bunch of other things too but it's that innate skill that's going to make you a master fencer and it's going to set you apart from the masses of a people who are just trying to predict your motions without actually feeling you and listening to what you're doing um, so that so the thing that BD was talking about about giving a signal to induce a reaction, that's that's grappling 101. That's bread and butter grappling tactics, but it's also bread and butter martial arts, right? So maybe that's a good way to end it. Um, you know, to summarize our our grappling section, there's lots of interesting things in grappling in and of itself. Um, it's fun to train. Uh, or many people find it fun to train anyway. Um, it's uh, possible to train with your fellow Emma students at a higher intensity in grappling than it is often with the sword, at least at first. But um, 
it's uh it's very it's very critical to do it's it's a carrots and peas situation for all ms students um the only difference between grappling and dagger is dagger is even more uh, even more deadly uh than than grappling it's even tighter you have to be even better with dagger than you can you can afford to make mistakes a little bit when you're wrestling um but this stuff is the absolute bedrock of your of anyone's desire to become a great fencer and it's possible to eke out some sensitivity and some other skills if you only ever experienced swordsmanship alone but not only is it not our experience that that's a useful way to go but it seems as if fiore didn't think that's what you should do either fiore talks about grappling as being the foundation of the art um, we're going to deal with a lot more grappling in the dagger section but it's going to be in a slightly different context. Um, but it's good for us to keep this in mind when we actually get into the sword and the pole axe and the spear and that we never forget where we came from, where we started. All right. Um, so that's the end of this session. Um, I think it's successfully recorded, so I'm going to try and upload it um, to YouTube this next week. And um, we'll see you in the next session, which is... Uh, January 11th at 8 a.m. Same bat time, same bat channel. All right. All of you have a wonderful evening. Hope uh, Stay safe and healthy, and um, we'll see you next time. Cool. Thanks, Aaron. My pleasure.